Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett and welcome to another episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. Today's episode is called 10 Strange UFO Sightings. This episode is actually really special to me because these particular sightings are among the first I've ever investigated. Many of them involve my family, my friends, co-workers, or their friends. And it was these particular sightings that really sent me on a quest to learn more about the nature of the UFO phenomenon. You may be thinking, oh, these are just sightings. How much they can they tell us? Well, no, no, no. Even a simple sighting uh, can reveal some very interesting insights into the nature of the UFO phenomena. And I chose these 10 particular sightings because I think each of them does contribute some valuable insights into the nature of UFOs and answers some of the many questions surrounding them. And the first case I'd like to talk about is actually the first case I ever investigated, and it occurred to my brother Mark in 1977. I remember the evening very clearly. I was 12, maybe 13 years old, and Mark comes running into the house saying, I just saw a UFO. It was amazing. It was really low. It was just above the telephone poles. It was so cool. And we all just kind of looked at him and shook our heads. Uh, many people in my family were very skeptical of UFOs. I know I certainly was. I just didn't believe in them. Uh, I was, yes, very young at the time, but uh, I remember thinking, no way. Mark, you are out of your mind. You must have uh, misperceived it, is what I thought, and I just refused to listen. And it wasn't until 1986 when I heard a report on the news about a UFO sighting over Alaska. That I thought, my God, this pilot... <laughs> He must be crazy. He must be misperceiving or lying or hallucinating. He couldn't have seen a UFO. Uh, but his whole crew saw it. It appeared on radar. It was a very impressive sighting. And it interested me. And I remembered my brother, Mark, had said he'd seen a UFO some 10 years earlier. And so st stupidly I approached him. And uh, this ended up changing my life forever. And I'm like, Mark, can you tell me about that UFO you saw? And he was absolutely delighted to speak about it uh, and uh, that I was interested in it. And he told me this really incredible story. Uh, this sighting occurred in Reseda, California, um, just outside of Los Angeles. And uh, he, Mark was with his two friends, Greg Randall and Phil Stevens. And they were just out uh, driving around at night, as uh, young men will do. They were, you know, 19, 20, 21 years old, young men, and had uh, just driving around th through the San Fernando Valley when they drove up along the hillside there, which overlooks the city lights. And it provides a really excellent view of the valley itself. And uh, they had no sooner pulled over when suddenly this object just boom appears right in front of their windshield it was just a few hundred feet away almost at eye level and they instantly knew that this was unusual it clearly wasn't a helicopter it was totally silent it was covered with colored lights it was metallic it had a bright white light on top it had some sort of a triangular superstructure on top and sort of a rounded bottom each of them provided slightly different descriptions of what they saw. But as they were watching this thing, it started to move. And as it moved away, they chased it in their Volkswagen microbus and actually chased this thing for several miles down Reseda Boulevard. Uh, it almost appeared as if this object was goading them along and that it was aware of them. And uh, it was very low level, at some point as low as uh, treetop level. And uh, it would hover, and then it would dart forward really fast, move at right angles, and then wait for them, and then they'd chase it along further. In fact, they passed several other cars who were also chasing this object. And I'll just let the witnesses describe what they saw in their own words, starting with my brother Mark. As Mark says... 
It was doing too many strange things to be a helicopter. It made a sharp 90 degree turn. It zigzagged, so we started to chase it. Phil also agrees it was unusual, and as Phil says, it looks sort of like a round bowl on the bottom. It looked like something out of Close Encounters. It looked like a pyramid almost, with a triangle on top. There were lights going up on each side, and it was pointed in the middle. Greg Randall gives a very similar description. As he says, it was disc-shaped and it was hovering. There was no sound. It had a row of lights below it in a U-shape. All of us were totally awestruck. We immediately took off chasing this thing. It made a real big impression on us. I don't know what it was, but I know it wasn't from around here. It really freaked us out. So these three young men kept this object in view for about 10, maybe 15 minutes, they believe. Uh, they, yeah, they passed other cars also staring at this thing and chasing it. And they chased it as far as uh, it would let them. <laughs> and uh, it seemed to be this, playing this little cat and mouse game with them. Because when they finally got close to it, it zipped instantly all the way back where it had come from many, many miles away. And was just this tiny little twinkling object. And then it darted away and was gone. So it looked as if it really wanted to be seen and it deeply impressed all three of them. Of the three witnesses, I think uh, probably Greg Randall w was the most frightened. Uh, Phil and my brother Mark were just deeply, deeply interested in it. At any rate, it convinced all three of them that UFOs were real and uh, Mark was really disappointed <laughs> when no one wanted to hear about what he had seen. Uh, what I find interesting about this sighting is, yeah, not only was it very low level, not only did it seem to be aware of them, but it was uh, shortly after this that my brother met his girlfriend, Christine Kisara, who would soon become his wife. And uh, I, of course, became very good friends with her as well. And she and I began to work together. She's an artist and she would illustrate many of the sightings I investigated and has done the covers for many of my books. Uh, we'd often go to UFO conventions together. Turns out that she herself has had sightings and is in fact a contactee. She had a number of uh, experiences, visitations when she was a little girl. So I don't know if that's a coincidence or not. <laughs> I tend to think not uh, because uh, it's just bizarre that my brother would end up uh, hooked up with someone who's also has a close relationship with UFOs. And for years and years, I assumed this was just a simple sighting uh, until something very strange happened. Uh, one evening, Mark and Christy were just sitting on the couch watching TV and Christy was caressing his arm and uh, suddenly she felt this weird object in his arm and she started touching it and poking at it and she's like, Mark, what's this? And Mark looked down. He had never even noticed it before. It was this weird object just beneath his skin. There's no scar there. There's no entry wound. But it's like this sort of little tiny metal bar about the size of a matchstick. And you can actually feel it. You can actually pull it out a little bit so you can see the entire shape of this. I've looked at it very closely. I'm like, wow, you know, when did this appear? Mark has no idea, and uh, finally I convinced him to see a doctor. Uh, I, I, by this point, I had joined MUFON, become a field investigator, and one of the gentlemen uh, at the UFO meeting, I became friends with him. Uh, he was a doctor and also a UFO researcher, and I finally convinced Mark to meet with him, and this doctor was very eager to see what might be in my brother's arm, and he examined it and poked at it and try, you know, looked at it as best as he could, you know, beneath the skin. And he was very impressed. His eyes went all wide. He's like, you know, do you have any idea when you got this? And Mark could only say, well, I did have a very close up UFO sighting, but I didn't have any missing time. Well, as far as he knows, he didn't. But sometimes missing time can be seamless. Uh, but the doctor did diagnose it as a foreign body. Um, he doesn't know what it was or what it is. 
Uh, my brother has declined to have it x-rayed or removed or uh, doesn't really like to talk about it. I mean, he's not shy about it. It's just he's a little sh shy about all of this. Uh, but yeah, now I'm wondering if my brother Mark uh, may have had direct contact. I don't know, but this phenomenon certainly is in my family because he's not the only family member who has had some very strange experiences. And that brings us to our next case. The next sighting I want to talk about, I call UFOs over Van Nuys Air Base. Uh, my sister-in-law, who married my other brother, uh, was with, in her house hanging out with her friends. This was around the same time as my brother's sighting, maybe a year earlier, 1976, 1977. My sister-in-law was in her home in Van Nuys, California. It's a very densely populated area. And uh, sh suddenly she and her friends noticed this weird orange light glowing outside. So they all went and saw outside, all three of them, and they got a real shock. There was this triangular formation of lights, which appeared to be hovering directly over Van Nuys Airport at a very low elevation. Uh, the formation was one light on top, two on the bottom, in a pretty much equilateral triangle. According to my sister-in-law, these could have been more than just lights, because sometimes she detected what appeared to be a metallic tinge to all of these things. And it was her impression this was one solid object. As she says, it was sort of a saucer shape. They were hovering. They formed sort of a triangle. They appeared shiny, maybe metallic, but all this orange glow was coming off them. It was lighting the whole area around them orange. Uh, that's all she really remembers, that this object was hovering in place and uh, staying perfectly still. She does not remember them moving off. Uh, I find this interesting because her friend, Adlai, remembers things a little bit differently. Uh, he recalls that, yes, these objects were very bright and casting this orange light all around the area. Uh, he remembers that they uh, were uh, very low, directly over the airbase, but according to Adlai, they weren't perfectly still in the sky. They were darting around a little bit, and it was his impression that these were three separate objects in a triangular formation. And as he says, and I quote, We saw three lights that appeared to be moving in unison. It seemed like I could have seen a shape behind the lights, but I couldn't be sure. But I sensed an intelligence behind the lights. It was a UFO. I just naturally accepted the fact that I caught a glimpse of something going by. So I find this sighting particularly interesting because the witnesses do have slightly varying accounts of what happened, and I now know that that's a red flag, that this could be more than just a sighting. I don't know, I'm a bit on the fence about that, uh, but it was very low level. What I find most interesting about this sighting is its location. It occurred in a very densely populated area directly over Van Nuys Air Base. UFOs do have a tendency to hover over airports. I know of many, many cases where they have done so. They seem to be very interested in technological installations. And I think that shows something about the nature of this phenomena, that ETs are keeping close tabs on our technology. So that, I think, is significant, and that's why I wanted to include uh, this particular sighting in this video. And now let's move to our next case, which I call Mark and the UFOs. I have a good friend by the name of Jason Hale. Uh, his family and our family are very good friends with each other. And at some point, Jason and his family decided to move out of California and to Hawaii. They bought some property on the island of Maui and built their own off-grid home. And it was here that Jason had a really interesting encounter. While on Maui, he befriended a gentleman by the name of Mark. And one day they're driving along a dirt road on Maui and uh, this UFO appeared. 
As Jason says, the two of us saw a light around 5,000, 6,000 feet up over the ocean, just this bright light hovering there. We stopped the car to watch it. We were watching it for about a minute, then we started to hear the noise of an airplane, and this object rose up into the cloud layer. The plane came into view and scared it away. And Jason was very impressed, and uh, his friend, however, was kind of blasé and casual about it, and said, oh, I see these all the time. And Jason said, really? You've, you've seen these before? And his friend Mark said, oh yeah, yeah, I've seen them many times. And uh, Jason asked, well, how many times? And Mark tilted his head and said, well, probably at least 40 times, uh, which really impressed uh, Jason. And he couldn't doubt Mark because he had seen this object himself. And Mark proceeded to tell, talk more about his sightings. According to Mark, he says he can sometimes sense when these objects are going to appear because he gets this very strong static electric feeling in his body whenever they're around. And sometimes this static electric feeling gets so strong, Mark has to take off his shoes and ground himself on the lava rocks because this energy is just pulsating through him. Mark also said that there have been a number of occasions where his these objects appear or he can feel them around and suddenly his Walkman radio will turn on by itself. He believes it's the ETs doing it to sort of announce their presence or play with them or because they want him to listen to certain songs, uh, which I find very interesting. And uh, on one occasion, uh, Mark got a telepathic message from the ETs that they would show up at a certain location at a certain time. Mark was very excited and gathered as many people as he could to witness this event. And uh, that's exactly what he did. Uh, everyone was gathered and waiting for these UFOs to show up and nothing happened. It was a bust. <laughs> they did not show up. Mark was pretty disappointed. It's his impression that uh, there was too many people there and that some of them weren't ready to see the UFOs and that the UFOs had become shy about announcing their presence to such a large group of people. So what I find very interesting about this case is this demonstrates what UFO researchers call the repeater problem. Some people see UFOs not once or twice, but over and over and over again. When investigators first ha heard about people like this, uh, they wondered about their credibility. But we now know that this is definitely a thing. Some people seem to attract UFOs. And uh, it's my belief that these people are, in fact, contactees, and that Mark is absolutely a contactee on some level. Uh, as Mark, Mark believes they're his friends and that he has some sort of relationship with these guys. And I think that's exactly what's going on here, and that's why this particular sighting is important, because it shows that UFOs are purposefully picking on certain people seem to be attracted to certain people uh, and are showing themselves to them on purpose and develop a relationship with them. So the next case I'd like to talk about actually occurred over Neptune. And when I say Neptune, I mean a little town in southern New Jersey. <laughs> the main witness is a family friend, uh, actually a friend of my eldest brother, and her name is Laura Beharry. And Laura was staying at our house one evening when uh, I asked her if she believed in UFOs. And she says, oh yeah, I had a really interesting sighting when I was about six years old. And I asked her if she would share it with me, if she'd let me interview her. And she happily agreed and described this really incredible sighting. And uh, according to Laura, it was 1957. And she was six years old, walking home from kindergarten, with her best friend. They lived only a few blocks from the school. And uh, this was a bright sunny day. And as they're walking down the sidewalk, both of their attentions was cert were uh, suddenly drawn towards this object that was swooping down out of the sky towards them. It was very obvious. It started out as sort of a star-like object in the distance and then got bigger and bigger and brighter and brighter 
and suddenly it was clearly a metallic saucer and heading for these electric power lines uh, right along the street. This is a very close up, very low level sighting. Uh, Laura has three really distinct memories as a young child. One is seeing two dogs fighting. Another is seeing two dogs making love. And the third is this incredible UFO sighting. As Laura says, what I saw was a strange object, a silvery object. It was coming towards us at a strange angle. In between myself and the object, there were power lines. And at the speed it was going, it looked like it was going to crash into the power lines. This object had a bright, bright white light underneath it. And in between this white light and the object itself, there was this sort of array of rainbow-like colors. So it was really beautiful. Red, blue, green, yellow, orange. It was absolutely gorgeous. And this object comes swooping down super fast, so fast I thought it was going to crash into the power lines. But instead, what does it do? It stops right over the power lines themselves and just hovers there. And there's all this electricity going between it and the power lines for just a few moments, at which point this object takes off like a bullet and it's just a blur in the sky and it's gone. As Laura says, it zipped off in the opposite direction. It was just a blur of light after that. It moved like something I've never seen move. I was amazed. Uh, I find this sighting uh, particularly illuminating uh, because it shows the tendency of UFOs to hover over power lines. This was the first case I had um, in which this happened, but it certainly wouldn't be the last. I think probably UFOs are sort of siphoning the electricity out of power lines. Uh, and the reason I say that, I mean, this is certainly something many other researchers have speculated. But at one point, I was able to interview a gentleman who had an onboard UFO experience, and he was inside a UFO when this exact thing happened. And the ETs said that that's what they were doing. So yeah, I think that's why UFOs are hovering over power lines. And this case is important because it demonstrates this behavior perfectly. I think it's also important because it shows that often many people have sightings at a very, very young age. They're just little kids. And uh, I think UFOs do that on purpose because kids are uh, non-judgmental. They don't discriminate. And they're also very impressionable. So this is a really good way to sort of convince someone of their presence. And I think that's what they're doing. I think they showed themselves to Laura and her friend on purpose in a way to sort of say, hi, we're real and don't forget us. And of course, Laura never did. Uh, it's the only sighting she's ever had, but it's left her with a very deep impression uh, that UFOs are real. And it's something she's recalled for the rest of her life. Moving on to the next case. This next case I call the Bell Vernon UFO Invasion. This occurred in the town of Bell Vernon, Pennsylvania. So a lot of sightings in Pennsylvania. And Bell Vernon is a particular hot spot. The main witness is Marlene Berkovich. Uh, she's a friend of a friend. And uh, as a young girl, seven years old, Marlene lived with her uh, two sisters and her family in this town of Bell Vernon, Pennsylvania. It's a pretty small town, but what's interesting is there was a lot of buzz going around at the time, this is the mid-1970s, about UFO activity in the area. About half the people in this town had seen UFOs, and these UFOs had a tendency to hover in this one particular area in these fields next to the town. And in these fields, there was an abandoned coal mine uh, so perhaps that was the draw. That was what was bringing them into this area. At any rate, Marlene had herself never seen anything until one evening, mid-1970s. She's with her two sisters, her younger sister and her older sister, in their room. Uh, Marlene's about seven years old. And uh, 
suddenly this object shows up right outside their window. It was actually below treetop level and right next to their house. As Marlene says, I saw one real close. It was maybe 20 feet away from my window, like a big helium balloon moving really slowly, like a big globe. It was getting ready to land up in the fields. It was round and it had a whole bunch of round windows. You could see a bunch of lights, panels flashing on and off inside. I'm sure that there were people sitting at the controls, but I didn't want to look. I was too scared to scream for my mom because I thought they might come out and take me, freeze me, or zap me. I didn't know what they would do. I was really scared. Yeah, she could actually see in through the portholes of this craft, which was about as big as a small house, she said, and she could see the actual control panels, which were covered with colored lights, yellow, blue, green, red, uh, it was very colorful, and the object itself was a shiny sort of metallic silver in a perfect round sphere. And maybe 10, 20 feet off the ground and 20 feet away from their window. Totally silent. And as it started to move away, uh, the girls who had been rooted to the spot at the time just watching this uh, r quickly ran downstairs and alerted their parents. They all ran outside and... Uh, it was still there, but now it was off in the distance and moving away. What I find interesting about this sighting is not only that it was so, so close to them <laughs> and that they could see inside this thing and see the actual panels and instruments inside this. Obviously, it was a craft of some kind. Uh, but what I think is really important about it is that this object was being drawn towards these certain fields where there is an abandoned coal mine. And this is a pattern we absolutely do see in a number of cases. UFOs do seem to be drawn towards areas where there are mines. Coal mines, iron mines, gold mines, silver mines, uranium mines. I mean, you name it, they're there. And uh, that seems to be what's going on in this case. Also interesting is that following this big wave of sightings, uh, the government came in and fenced this whole area off and put up big signs, government property, keep out, no trespassing. And uh, that, <laughs> I don't think that's a coincidence either. Um, certainly we've seen that in other areas, such as upstate New York, where there are also mines, and the government purchased a bunch of property, and again, uh, put up signs, government property, keep out. So it's clear to me our government is aware of this activity in our doing their best to cover it up and keep people away from particular hotspots. Also significant about this particular case in Del Vernon is it shows that there are some areas that are particularly conducive to sightings. It seems like each state has its UFO hotspot or each area, and certainly that's true in this case. All right, moving along. The next case I'd like to talk about I call the Great San Fernando Valley Fireball. This occurred to a family member of one of my co-workers. The main witness is Joel Stein. Uh, he was a teenager at the time, 18, 19 years old, and he and his friend were out hiking in the hills behind their house in Granada Hills, California. This was a nice warm summer night in 1976. Uh, again, at that same time, my brother saw a UFO, my sister-in-law. Must have been a wave of sightings at that time. At any rate, Joel is out there hiking in what was then a pretty rural area. I mean, there was a lot of uh, undeveloped countryside near their homes, and they were just hiking through the fields, having a good time, when suddenly they had a very frightening experience. This very large object came swooping down from a very high altitude and came right down over their heads, maybe a couple of hundred feet high. And uh, according to Joel, this thing covered a good portion of the sky. It was absolutely gigantic. And he said it reminded him of a, what it looked like was a house on fire flying through the air. Uh, when I heard that description, um, I was kind of amazed because this, 
I've had many people tell me that same exact uh, phrase, that it looked, what they saw looked like a house on fire flying through the air. <laughs> I mean, if I had a nickel for every time someone told me that, I'd have, well, a dollar at least. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, Joel found and his friend found this experience very frightening. As Joel says, I look up and something caught my eye. I remember it looking so much like a house, the size of a house, like a, like a roof. It was dark red with an orange outer layer. It looked like a house on fire flying through the air. It went across the sky. I've never been so scared in my life. This scared the hell out of me. We ran down the street and just took off. Uh, they saw it for maybe about a minute and uh, were really too frightened to keep looking at it. They were afraid it was chasing them. Uh, this thing left a big contrail behind it and uh, scared the living daylights out of them. They ran from the area, kept running all the way up their street and into the closest uh, home of their homes uh, so they ran into Joel's friend's home, ran upstairs, ran to his bedroom, closed the door, and sat down, just breathless and amazed. As Joel says, we couldn't even talk. We just couldn't believe this. Uh, while he described the object as being uh, shaped like a house, he says it was actually much, much bigger than a house. Uh, he couldn't really tell uh, because he wasn't sure how high up it was, but it seemed pretty low. Uh, they didn't hear any sound, but it did seem to be like covered with uh, this fiery sort of corona all around it. And they were so amazed, they at first kept quiet. They didn't want to tell anybody. Uh, besides, they were sure this was going to be front page news. This was going to be on the news for sure. And the next day it wasn't. It wasn't on any of the news channels. And they actually went to the newspapers and looked at the newspapers and nope. There was not one article about it, and they were very disappointed. And I asked them, I'm like, well, did you report your sighting? And no, they did not tell anybody. Well, eventually, they did tell their parents. Their parents were very religious and said, oh, it sounds like a sign from God. Uh, Joel disagrees. Uh, he thinks it's a genuine UFO. And to this day, he's baffled why more people didn't see it and why it wasn't in the newspapers. And uh, I think the answer for this is self-evident. Uh, he didn't report it. Probably a lot of other people did see it, and they didn't report it either. I think this is important because it goes to show that any estimates of the number of sightings is probably <laughs> uh, vastly underestimated. I'm sure there are a lot more sightings out there than are officially recorded because most people do not report their sightings. It's not one in 10, it's closer to one in 100 people who actually report their sighting. And uh, this sighting, um, Joel says, was absolutely the scariest experience of his entire life. He's never seen a UFO before or since. Uh, he doesn't believe he had a missing time or was abducted or anything like that, but he certainly will never forget it <laughs> just because this thing came down and seemed to be targeting them. It swooped right over their heads and just scared the living daylights out of them. Uh, Joel says he's been in a lot of scary situations since then, but nothing came close to the fear he felt with this one particular sighting. So the next sighting I'd like to talk about, I call a cluster of colored lights. This occurred in 1965 in the town of Gardena, California. Again, this is a pretty densely populated suburb outside of Los Angeles County. And uh, the main witness is Adam Reed. And uh, although Adam was four years old, just a little tyke, he remembers it vividly. Uh, at the time, his family was having a party. There was a lot of people there. And uh, the father went outside and suddenly came running back inside and said, everyone come outside, there's a UFO. So a group of about 10 people uh, ran outside, including Adam. And Adam was absolutely shocked because he saw this object, which he at first thought was a helicopter, except it was making no sound. And it was covered with colored lights. In fact, it looked like a cluster of colored lights, about seven or eight of them. Each was a different color, very soft pastel colors of 
orange, yellow, red, pink, blue, green. It was really beautiful. And it was maybe a hundred feet high. And at first it was moving in a straight line, but then it stopped. It hovered in place and it started darting around as if quartering the neighborhood looking for something. At least that was Adam's impression. As Adam says, it was traveling in a straight line faster than I was used to seeing things move. Then it stopped and hovered like a helicopter. Then it kind of scooted across the sky in a zigzag fashion, like zip, zip, zip. It zigzagged across the sky quite a bit. To me, it impressed me very much that it was looking for something. It was almost right over us. So they watched it for just a few minutes, maybe five minutes at most, when it finally darted off. And as Adam says, there was a long debate about what it was. It was one of those things in childhood that you just don't forget. Today, as an adult, he's absolutely convinced it was a genuine UFO. And uh, what I find very interesting about this encounter is some years later, um, he brought it up to his family and some of the family members who were there do not remember this sighting at all. It was completely erased from their memory. And they were there, uh, which is interesting because other family members remember it very vividly, including Adam. Adam was also impressed that it was looking for something, uh, which really makes me wonder. And having investigated UFOs for many years, I've come to realize that one person's sighting is probably another person's abduction. So it wouldn't surprise me a bit if that UFO came down and had scooped someone up and was doing their thing uh, and uh, had abducted somebody. So that I find interesting. And also uh, because the way it was looking around and sort of quartering the neighborhood searching for something. And another thing I find interesting is the, this weird uh, amnesia problem. Why is it that some family members don't remember this at all? Uh, I don't think that's the human mind doing this because often we do see memory problems associated with UFOs, uh, particularly with onboard experiences. So that's a big red flag to me that maybe this was more than just a sighting. Very hard to say. But again, I think it's important because this sighting shows uh, that there are weird amnesia problems associated not only with onboard UFO encounters, but sometimes with simple sightings. Or maybe this was more than a simple sighting. It was very low. And when a UFO gets within 100 feet of a witness, that to me is another red flag. So we've got two major red flags here in this case that make me think that this could have very well been more than just a simple sighting. The next case I want to talk about occurred to a gentleman by the name of Arnie Weiler. Uh, he's in the film business, as my father was. He was a friend of my father's. And uh, this sighting occurred in the early 1960s in downtown Cleveland, Ohio. It was a bright, sunny afternoon, and Arnie Weiler was on a metro bus when he was passing by this area, the city center. And in the city center of Cleveland, there's this huge building called the Terminal Tower. It's a very famous building. It's a very famous landmark. And uh, Arnie looks out the window of the bus and gets a real shock. Everyone was watching this. Hundreds of people saw this. Uh, surrounding the Terminal Tower, there was a group of metallic discs, four or five of them. As Arnie says, I was on a bus. There's a building in the square where all the streets meet called the Terminal Tower. I looked up and saw what looked like discs of light. There were several of them and one larger one off to the side. Everybody saw them and it was printed in the Cleveland newspaper. According to Arnie, these objects were mostly white, but they did have a sort of a colorful corona surrounding them that was sort of a blue purple color that would fade in and out in sort of this sort of pulsating fashion. And these objects just hovered there. Um, he wanted to watch them further, but he was on the bus and the bus didn't stop. And uh, they just drove by, but he saw them very clearly. 
and they were clearly uh, solid discs and uh, you couldn't tell if they were metallic or not because they were glowing so brightly but as far as he knows they were completely silent very close to the building itself and uh, really impressed him deeply uh, that uh, these were not anything normal and yeah it did appear in the newspapers the next day and as he recalls that there somebody did in fact capture photographs of them. Unfortunately, I was not able to locate the newspaper article. Uh, but yeah, it's a very impressive sighting, which is important here, I think, because uh, this particular sighting shows the tendency of UFOs to put on a display. Often UFO behavior seems to be evasive, as if they don't want to be seen. But sometimes it's the opposite. They obviously want to be seen and will sort of put on a little show for the witnesses. And that seems to be what's going on in this case, as if they want to be seen, as if to announce their presence. So that, I think, makes this case particularly significant. That, and it also that it was in a very urban area, and also that it was very widely viewed, which again makes me think UFOs are putting on a publicity campaign announcing their presence bit by bit to, you know, either to small groups of people singly or larger groups of people, as happened in this case. And that brings us to the next case, which is also a display. I call this next case the Pacoima UFO display. This occurred in 1968 over the town of Pacoima, California, and the main witnesses are the Tanoe family. Uh, the Tanoe family consists of four members, the father, the mother, and two young boys. Uh, Ron Tanoe, the gentleman I interviewed, was about seven years old at the time of this sighting. And how it all began is they were driving home one evening. They were a couple of miles from their home when his father noticed this very bright star-like object hovering at what appeared to be a pretty low elevation in the sky, a couple of thousand feet up at the highest. And he says, look everyone, what's that? Keep your eye on it. That does not look normal. And uh, he had to keep his eye on the road. And uh, he quickly drove home and got, you know, parked the car. And uh, everyone got out of the car and were staring at this thing. Ron's father rushed inside to grab his binoculars. He had been in the military and was able to obtain a pair of very powerful binoculars. They were huge. And uh, he looked at them through binoculars and was really impressed because through binoculars you could actually see the shape of this thing, which was sort of cigar-shaped. And it was very, very bright. Uh, Ron also looked at this object through the binoculars, as did every family member. But as Ron says, and I quote, it was very bright almost piercing to the eye. It would lose brightness and change shape. It looked almost like an oval with two end points. It would make vertical movements up and down, then a 90 degree angle to the left or right. It was just so quick. It was amazing. Then it seemed like it was getting closer and closer, and it got to the point where you could see like portholes or brighter lights coming out of certain portions. At this point, some of them started to get nervous. Uh, Ron's mother and younger brother uh, retreated back inside the home. Uh, but Ron's father was very interested in this thing. Uh, he was familiar with all kinds of aircraft and was not able to identify it. And uh, kept looking at it through the binoculars and pointing out these strange features to his son, Ron. And uh, they were wondering if these were portholes that they were looking at or lights along the edge of this object. And as they were watching it, it started to release smaller objects. First one came out and it hovered uh, to the left side of this object and sort of started darting around a little bit. And then another object came out and it hovered over to the right side of this object and at this point, all three objects are just sort of moving around in these tight, sort of sharply defined motions. Wasn't going all across the sky. It was staying pretty much in the same area, but going up and down and back and forth and moving in ways that completely defy conventional aircraft. 
Couldn't have been a helicopter. Definitely wasn't a plane or a balloon or a meteor or a shooting star or a satellite or anything like this. Uh, they estimate it was, yeah, maybe 2,000 feet high. Uh, very hard to say because I couldn't quite tell how large this object was. But given that it was releasing smaller objects, at that point they realized that this object was a bit bigger than they thought and that it was perhaps a mothership and that these smaller craft were maybe 10, 20 feet in diameter. Pure speculation, they really couldn't tell. But it impressed them very deeply. And at this point, Ron was almost beside himself. He, uh, he started to get a little antsy, a little scared. As he says, I started getting scared. I was getting skittish and kept wondering if these guys were going to land here and take me away or something like that. I ran inside and told my mom, call the police. I was all excited. I ran back outside and told my dad, come back in, come back in. His father, of course, refused. His father wasn't the least bit afraid. He was just very, very curious about what possibly this thing could be. It was almost as if it was putting on a little show for them. And uh, Ron uh, gathered his courage back up and kept, stayed out there and kept looking at this thing through the binoculars for over an hour. This object stayed there for a very long time. And at some point, these smaller objects, either they darted away or perhaps went back inside the larger object. They couldn't quite tell. But after these smaller objects disappeared, the larger object, it didn't move away. Instead, it slowly faded away, became dimmer and dimmer, and, or turned invisible, perhaps. And within a matter of seconds, it was gone. But this left Ron an uh, absolute believer in UFOs and impressed him very, very deeply that UFOs are real. As he says, I'll remember it for the rest of my life. I don't disbelieve in UFOs. I believe in them. I believe there is something there. And I like this case because it has a number of really interesting features that provide an insight into this phenomena. One is that um, these objects can be very large and sometimes contain smaller craft. Another is that they will put on these displays and sort of show themselves off. I think this behavior is very intentional and I'm speculating that the purpose of this type of display is to convince people of their presence. It's sort of a grassroots publicity campaign, uh, which I think is leading towards the ET agenda to openly announce their presence and have direct contact with humanity at large. I think that will happen, and perhaps very soon. I sure hope so, uh, but we will see. At any rate, th this is the type of behavior investigators do call a UFO display and shows that in some cases UFOs have no fear of being seen but instead want to be seen. And now we get to the last case. And the last case I want to talk about I call an unsolved mystery. This occurred in downtown Burbank, California over a very densely populated area. In fact, this occurred directly over NBC Studios. And it occurred on July 15th, 1992. At that time, there was a huge wave of sightings uh, in the nearby mountains. So that could be related to this. But yeah, this is over a very densely populated area. And how it all began was when one of the employees at NBC uh, had an impulse to walk outside of the building. Uh, the main witness I interviewed, actually interviewed two gentlemen who saw this. Uh, the first witness is Eric Weissman, and the second witness is John Dunn. They are both employees for the television program Unsolved Mysteries, which is an interesting coincidence in and of itself. But at any rate, Eric Weissman felt this impulse to just go outside. This was during the evening. And uh, they were doing telescening, sort of getting the, they worked behind the scenes uh, with the uh, photographic uh, group of uh, this production company for Unsolved Mysteries. And Eric Weissman walked outside and had a feeling that someone was looking at him. 
and f he looked around and uh, didn't see anything at first, turned around and looked up and was shocked to see this object. And he said that it was, quote, almost as if it was calling me. It was this very strangely shaped object. He couldn't quite tell what shape it was. Uh, and it was just hovering there, maybe 2,000, 3,000 feet high, directly over NBC Studios. As he says, this thing was very steady, very large, and did not move. It did not budge in the sky. It just sat there for a long time. It looked like a square or a rectangle. It was a dark mass, but at times I picked up a silverish red tinge. It was definitely a solid mass. Well, Eric could hardly believe his eyes, so he did the first thing anyone should do when they see a UFO, is get another witness. So Eric ran back inside and told John, come outside, come outside, you have got to see this. And John Dunn thought that his coworker was, uh, maybe had spotted some pretty lady or something. And so he casually walks outside, not realizing he's just about to have one of the most amazing encounters of his life. And John Dunn steps outside and gets a real shock. He can see this object hovering 2,000 feet high, and uh, he gets a very strange feeling because he's skeptical of UFOs and uh, didn't really believe in them, never really gave them much thought, despite actually you know, working on Unsolved Mysteries, the program. And uh, he was shocked at what he was seeing. As John says, and I quote, we were actually working on a UFO story that day. It's pretty strange. It, it looked like a pen top. It just sat there. It was a really weird feeling because I could not identify it at all. It was just hovering, just sitting there. I was a little startled by it. Your mind starts wondering, what could it be? We looked at it and the object almost morphed a little bit, almost as, it as if it was changing shape, kind of like twisting. So as they watched, it changed from a square shape to sort of a triangular shape to almost a cylindrical shape and just a weird shape. It was morphing and twisting and uh, just staying rock steady in the sky, which again is a feature we see in many UFO encounters, as if this thing is like, stone still in the sky, just not moving even a little bit. But it was changing shape. Uh, turns out Eric is a kite enthusiast. He has all kinds of kites. He loves kites. And that was his first thought, like, well, maybe this thing was a kite. Uh, it was a very windy night, and they're looking at this thing, and uh, that was his first thought. Uh, but it clearly wasn't a kite. It wasn't moving even a little bit. Clearly wasn't a plane or a helicopter. It was totally silent. Obviously, it couldn't have been a satellite or a balloon or ball lightning or anything that they could readily identify. And they just stared at it and were really surprised when this thing started changing shape, which is, again, a rare detail that we do see in a number of these UFO sighting reports. And after staring at it for several minutes, uh, Eric just couldn't take it anymore. He's like... I have to go see if we can get closer to this thing. Because uh, they were looking at it at kind of a 45 degree angle. And so he decided he was going to get in his car and drive directly underneath it. And so he quickly walks over to his car, keeping his eyes glued to the object. He's still watching it as he gets in his car and closes the door. And he looks down to turn the car on, you know, put the key in and, and start the ignition. And he looks up and the object is gone. It's just disappeared. He jumps out and runs over to uh, John. And he's like, where is it? Where is it? And John's like, I don't know. It just disappeared. It's gone. They didn't see it move away. It was just there. And then it wasn't there. Gone. And uh, both of them were very deeply impressed that this was something that they had never seen before. Eric is absolutely convinced it was a genuine UFO. John, who um, tr tried to cling to his skepticism, but admits that uh, he cannot explain it. As John says, it was just a really weird experience. I have no idea what it was. I'm not saying it's a UFO. 
All I know is that it wasn't anything I've ever seen, and it was just sitting there. So I think this case is important uh, for a number of reasons. I think it's a funny coincidence that they were both working with the television program Unsolved Mysteries on a UFO story that day. Makes me wonder if the UFO knew that. <laughs> and I also find it very interesting that John, or I mean, I'm sorry, that Eric felt a strong impulse to go outside and felt like somebody was watching him and actually um, stated that directly, that he felt like this thing was calling out to him. Uh, this was one of the first cases I've had where people describe this sort of strong impulse to go outside, but I've since then heard it many times, and I don't think that's a coincidence. I think UFOs are telepathically calling out to people, and again, this is sort of a display, a way for these UFOs to announce their presence. I'm wondering if these UFO occupants are like, hey, these guys are working on a UFO program, uh, and uh, th this other guy, John, doesn't even believe in us. Let's call them out and show them that we're real. Uh, of course, that's pure speculation, but uh, having heard so many people describe these strong impulse to go outside and then they see a UFO, I really wonder, and it looks like that's what's happening in this case. I also find it very interesting, the location of this sighting, that it was directly over NBC Studios, a major media company. Uh, so that also is significant. I was always under the impression that UFOs were seen in very rural areas. Well, that's actually not true. Certainly there are sightings of UFOs in rural areas, but there are just as many sightings in suburban areas and urban areas as well. And that's true in this case. And that's why I wanted to include the sighting in this list. So these 10 sightings, yeah, they're among the first group of sightings I investigated, and I chose these 10 sightings in particular because, as I said, they each have something significant to contribute to our understanding of the UFO phenomena, and uh, each of these details that I pointed out are, are things that I've heard over and over again from other people. Uh, one thing I do find very interesting about these sightings is that None of these witnesses were alone when they saw these UFOs. Not one of them. Every single one of them had witnesses along with them. Uh, sometimes it was just a couple of people, but other times it was, you know, a dozen, or even like in a couple of cases, like Arnie Weiler's case at the Terminal Tower, at least a hundred people saw this thing. Uh, so yeah, they've got many interesting things to say about UFOs. Uh, we as we've seen, many of these sightings occur over dense population centers. I think that's important. Uh, the impulse to look outside, uh, that turns up in many cases. Their strange morphing abilities, uh, the fact that some of these craft are very, very large and that they may contain other craft, little smaller craft, I think that's important. I think it's also important that none of these 10 sightings appeared in any newspaper or any television program. None of them received any publicity at all, really. Uh, so that, I think, shows that any estimates of how common UFO sightings are way wrong. They're way, way low. The National UFO Reporting Center, NUFORC, and the Mutual UFO Network, MUFON, each receive dozens of sites, uh, sighting reports daily. So if only one person in a hundred is reporting their sighting and we have 20, say I'll give you a low figure, I think it's more than that, tw 20 recorded sightings a day, well we could, if you were to times that by 10, that would be 200. But if you were to times that by 100, well I mean that's 2,000 sightings daily, uh, which would mean that at any given second, really, or any given minute, someone is having a close encounter. So I think this is an ongoing phenomena and uh, is much, much more common than people, most people believe, because uh, most people do not report their sighting. Another thing that I think that turns up in a number of these cases is that weird display type behavior, which again shows that UFOs have a campaign, an agenda, to announce their presence. They're very carefully doing this sort of publicity campaign and showing themselves to people 
which again, I think, is leading towards open official contact. They want us to know that they are real, but they're announcing their presence in a way that won't completely uh, send off an atom bomb <laughs> in society. Um, they're doing it as gently as possible and getting us used to their presence. Another thing I find very interesting is that uh, a number of these sightings could very well be more than sightings. I mean, if someone is feeling physical effects, if these objects are getting very, very low level, 100 feet or lower, if, these, if someone walks away uh, with some sort of physical reaction, such as an implant, <laughs> I mean, or memory problems, these are all red flags that it is more than just a sighting and that some sort of contact took place on a much deeper level, uh, in including up to the possibility of actual onboard UFO experience. Uh, another thing that I find interesting is, in, at least in one of these cases, is these UFOs' tendency to hover over power lines. We've seen this over and over again. And again, this shows, uh, gives us a little bit of insight into the nature of these UFO engines and that perhaps we're able to siphon electricity out of power lines. And also points to the you know, relationship between UFOs and power outages, which has occurred many, many times. A good example is the great New York blackout, which was directly tied to a large cluster of UFO sightings in New York State. Uh, so the most important factor, I think, is that each and every single one of these witnesses was deeply, deeply impressed. They do not believe they saw anything that could be explained as weather phenomena, or as you know, astronomical phenomena, or any type of conventional aircraft or balloon or anything human-made, all of them are convinced pretty much, uh, without exception, uh, that this was something probably not from here, extraterrestrial. Uh, so all of them are very, very deeply impressed to the point that they pretty much all believe in UFOs now. <laughs> And it's something that they will remember for the rest of their lives. And that, I think, is the real takeaway here. So that's this episode for, for today. I want to thank you once again for watching. I really appreciate it. I hope you've enjoyed it. And as I always like to say, keep having fun.